for a meditation this afternoon. Kindly turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 13. Matthew chapter 5, starting from verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth, and if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out, and to be trodden under foot of man. Verse 14. Ye are the salt of the ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And finally, verse 16. Let your light so shine before man that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. William Barclay, one of the great theologians in the modern times, tells an experience that he had as he met with a man and they had a long conversation. The man turned to William Barclay and said, Guess, you know what, let me share with you an experience that I had just a few days ago. I was in a very important building, meeting some of the important officials, and as I was entering into the building, I saw a great scholar who had been teaching in most, one of the prestigious universities in Europe. And I immediately remembered that there is a guy living on the same street that I live, and he had mentioned to me that he was a student of this great scholar. And so William Barclay says that this man turned to William Barclay and said, I went to this scholar and told him, Sir, I have something to share with you. There's an young man who lives down the street, and he says he was your student. And the scholar whose name is not mentioned in this story says, he thought for a moment and said, Well, that young man would have been present for my lecture classes, but I don't think so, he was my student. Listening to this, William Barclay commenting on it says, there is a world of difference between listening to a lecture and being a student of a great scholar. And he, and he draws a very great parallel, it says, in the Christian world, the supreme hypocrisy or the supreme handicap is that too many of us are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ from a distance. And very few are real disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question at the very outset. What kind of picture do you have of the God that you worship? What perception do you have of the God that you trust? How big is your God or how small is your God? This morning in tune with what the VBS uh, family has been emphasizing throughout the week, to be fishers of men. This is God's call. This is God's challenge to us. But for us to be fishers of men, first of all, we got to appreciate whom we are following. We are the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. I cannot go and be a fisher of men if I am not, to begin with, a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is only when I am a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ that I can be very effective in being fishers of men. And so, at the very outset, I thought, let me present to you not what I think, not what I imagine, it is not my opinion, but what the Word of God says of the God that you and I worship. At the very outset, I see that in, 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 in the book of Psalms, chapter 17, verse 8, it says that you are the apple of his eyes. I want you to appreciate the God that you worship, my friends, because he looks down upon this planet Earth, on each one of us individually, and says, you are the apple of my eyes. But unfortunately, many a times, because of self-centered decisions, actions, we make our God very small and very insignificant. And what is the result of it? Our life is filled with fear and anxiety. Why? Everything revolves around us. Nothing outside of us. And so there is fear, there is anxiety in your life, in what you do, in what you say, in how you go about. Not only there is fear and anxiety in your life, my friends, 
you become very ineffective in your witnessing. Why? Because you are fearful of rejection. Will that person listen to me? Or is he going to look at me and say, you are a very weird person. You are not with the crowd. You also are very not generous in your giving because your financial stability is centered around you. Because God is outside of your circle. Because he is too small. And so you begin to say, the Lord is too small, so I'm going to handle my own financial, financial obligations. As such, you don't want to give out. You want to keep it because you don't know as to whether you're going to meet the demands of your home financially at the end of each month. My friends, when you begin to look down upon God as someone very small, very insignificant, your prayers are without faith. Your service is without joy. Your sacrifice is without hope. And your living is without conviction. And so you begin to just live a normal Christian life. And in the words of William Barclay, we are just followers of the Lord Jesus Christ from a distance, but not true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is such a God that tells you and me, be fishers of man. It is such a God who tells us, as I read here from Matthew chapter 5, that ye are the salt of the earth. We are supposed to lighten up, make the lives of people that we come in touch, something bright, something tasteful, because you are representing your master. In your words, in your actions, and even in your thinking. And the Lord himself said, you're not only salt of the earth, he goes further and says, you are the light of the world. You're supposed to lighten up the corner that you're in. Whether you're in your workplace, in your home, in your church, in your marketplace, wherever you are, that is what God has called us to do. To be fishers of man. To be his true disciples. As it was read to us very beautifully by Shashi, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17, the Lord says, Why do I call you as my disciple, as my, uh, and give you this call to be fishers of men? He says, You know why? Because I'm the God of gods. I am the Lord of lords. I'm a great God. I'm a mighty God. Such is my position. Such is what I am. And when I give you this call, do not hesitate. Do not have any reservation. Do not be suspicious. Do not question. Can I do this? No. Because I am the mighty God, a great God. He doesn't stop right there, my friends. He goes a step further. As we read here again in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 1, he says, I am the one who created you. I am the one who formed you. I am the one who redeemed you. I am the one who called you. And I love the way he ends such a, in that verse. Isaiah the prophet, the great messianic prophet, he says, God says, I am possession of you. In other words, you are God's possession. What a comforting thought from God's word to realize what a great and awesome God that we worship. And as such, we should not be hesitant to go around and tell the world, I have come to be an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning for a meditation, short meditation, I want to very humbly present to you on the authority of God's word three kinds of discipleship that we find in the Christian world, including in the Adventist churches. And I want you to know that I'm not speaking to you, but I'm speaking to myself first. As I sat down and as I prayed and as I researched, as I meditated, and as I was putting my thoughts together, it drove me with great force, with great uh, emphasis to re-examine myself and see, am I a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? And it is my prayer that as a result of our meditation this morning, this afternoon, that we will resolve in our hearts that come what may with God's grace, with God's strength, with the help of the Holy Spirit, that we would be true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let me get into the very first type of discipleship. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 8, verse 42. Luke chapter 8, verse 42. I'm going to emphasize the last part of this verse. And he says, but as he went... The people thronged him. 
I want to set the stage as to when this verse was uttered. Jesus Christ is on the way to Jairus' daughter to do a miracle there. But a great crowd is following the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in the great crowd, here is a woman who had a problem for the last 12 years, spent every penny that she had with no result whatsoever. And she decides in her mind, if I can only touch the hem of his garment, I'm going to be healed with great faith, with great trust. She walks down into the crowd, crawls on the ground, not wanting to be recognized. Somehow she touches the hem of the garment and then she is completely healed. And the Bible says there was a great crowd that thronged upon him. The first type of discipleship that we find in the world today is what I would name it as curious discipleship. People by nature, we as human by nature, are curious, my friends. Those of us who drive know that any time there's an accident, either on an ordinary road or on a highway or on a beltway, what happens? The traffic gets backed up. Not because you're met with an accident, no. Somebody else had an accident and the road is blocked or even if the cars have been moved away from the lanes, what happens? The cars begin to move slow. How far? Till that accident spot. We move very slowly there, we come there, we pause, we look to the side and want to see, not because you want to have, just out of curiosity, what has happened, who is involved, and then once you have seen that, you pick up your spirit again. And then you begin to wonder what happened. Till now, the car was moving bumper to bumper, and right now I'm going at 65 miles an hour. Why? Because we are so curious, so anxious, just to see what has happened. That is human nature. Nothing evil about it. Nothing wrong about it. I'm just trying to acknowledge my own human nature. And more so, even in a Christian warfare, we are many a times curious. And during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, as you walked on the dusty roads of Galilee, my friends, people were curious. They followed him wherever he went, not because they wanted to listen to him every word and believe every word. No. Men, most of them came because they were just curious. They were looking for excitement, something that would stir them up. What is the next miracle that is, is he going to perform? What is the next great event that he's going to do? Is he going to raise someone from the dead? Is he going to heal a leper? Is he going to give sight to the blind? Out of curiosity, people followed. And let me go a step further. Even the Pharisees that came, although back of their mind they wanted to find fault with him, as humans, they were also curious. What is Jesus going to do next? My friends, in our encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, it is good to be curious to begin with. But if you stop right there, your Christian journey is, is on a dangerous path. Here the text says, a crowd, people throng him. A great crowd followed him. At one point he fed 5,000 people. Not all 5,000 were the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, my friends. At another time, he fed 4,000 people. Not all of them were the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not at all. In fact, at some times, we have seen the gospel story that Jesus had to get into the boat to speak to the people. Why? Because the crowd was just falling upon him. And so there was a great crowd, curious crowd, wanting to know what he was going to do next. But not all of them believed. And so here comes the crux of the problem with regard to the curious discipleship. It is good to be curious to begin with. But if you remain curious, your journey is on a faithful status. It is dangerous to remain a curious disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why, my friends? Because curiosity does not save us. Just being curious about the right person. No question, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. No question about it. And so you become curious about it. You read all the literature you can. Read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But if you stop right there and not go further in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not a true disciple of Lord Jesus Christ. It is not true discipleship. And that brings me to the second point. The second type of discipleship that you find in the world today, in the churches all around the world, is what we call convinced discipleship. Number one, curious discipleship. Number two, convinced discipleship. I want you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 23. 
If I'm not mistaken, it's verse 14, I think. Where Jesus is now in the last night before his crucifixion. He's standing before Pilate. Many accusations have been laid against him. People are shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And then from the side, Pilate's wife whispers and says, no, do not have any part with it because the man that is standing before you is innocent. And then after all the thoughts that went through his mind, Pilate finally says in this text, he turns to the chief priest and to the people and says what? I find no fault in him. I want you to know, my friends, that always curious discipleship will lead to convinced discipleship. Why do I say so? When you're curious, you go to a spot, go to your place, go to your person, you begin to see, you begin to hear, you begin to witness, you begin to believe, and then you begin to experience the awesomeness of the God in this case. It is only when you come and have an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ that you begin to get convinced in your heart that surely he is the Son of God. That he is the redeemer of the world and he is the only one that can save me. But if I don't have that encounter, a real close, intimate encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no way I can become a convinced disciple. But I'm going to say this, again on the authority of God's word. To remain a convinced disciple is not good enough. It is not good enough to be a curious disciple. Because you cannot be a real fisher of man. You cannot be a convinced disciple because you cannot be a real fisher of man. Take the example of Pilate, my friends. He was convinced the man that is standing before him, whose future, whose life was in his hand and his decision, was convinced that surely he is more than the carpenter's son, that he is more than the son of Mary and Joseph, that he is more than an ordinary human being. He was fully convinced in his mind. Mentally, he had made a, he knew exactly who he was. But he was only convinced, and he stopped with that. He was more interested in preserving his job as the governor of Judea. Nothing more. And so he hands over the man into the hands of the crowd. Take the example of the rich and ruler who came to the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing he lacked in life. He was rich, so he had all the gold and silver that he wanted. He was in his youth, so he was full of life. He was not sickly, and he was a ruler. He had the influence. What was he lacking? Nothing whatsoever. But then he comes to Jesus, and he acknowledged Jesus as someone very special. That's why I'm saying he was convinced in his mind. And so when he comes to Jesus Christ, what does he say? Good master. He recognized him as a good man. He also recognized him as a master, something that he can get out of him, and says, what must I do to be saved? And he was hoping that Jesus was going to pat him on the back. Yes, the first part of the story, he did pat him on the back when he said, go and keep the commandments. Oh Lord, I have done it all, all through my youth. But then Jesus looked right into the heart of this man, what was lagging deep down in his heart, and says, go and sell what you have. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. And the story ends in a very sorrowful way because the Bible declares to me, my friends, the rich young ruler went away how? Sorrowfully. Because he just wanted to remain as being convinced disciple. I think more. How about Agrippa, the great king? Paul, as he stood before him, narrated the great experience that he had on the road to Damascus. The great encounter, how he was blind for three days, how he got his sight back, how the Lord has used him to establish many churches and talked about the risen Savior and how he's going to come back. And listening to the great presentation that was done with great passion, with great conviction, Agrippa says, you almost make me what? A Christian. Almost, my friends, is not good enough. You've got to go a step further and say, Lord, I believe and you and you are the only savior that I have in this world. We just cannot be a convinced disciple. Let me share with you nothing new again. The devil is convinced that Jesus is indeed the son of God. He lived with him in heaven. He knows that Jesus is the son of God. And when Jesus came down, the devil knew that he is going to die on the cross, that he is going to come out of the grave. He knew about it. There is nothing. He knows the Bible well. More than you and me, he knows who Jesus is. 
He is fully convinced that Jesus is the Son of God. And so don't ever be carried away by saying, well, I'm convinced that Jesus is my God. Because even the devil believes that. But the devil is not going to make it to happen. As such, we got to move a step further, my friend. That brings me to my third important point. Before that, let me just share with you this thought that came to my mind. Christian discipleship is not an intellectual exercise of your brain, but it is a loving, intimate relationship that originates from your heart. That is what Christian discipleship is. There are many scholars who can stand and give great talks about the Bible, about Jesus, about his character, about the virtues, about the doctrines. That is not what makes you and me a good Christian or a good disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. What makes you and me a, a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ is not having just an intellectual exercise of my brain, but rather an intimate relationship that originates from the heart. Because Lord, because what you have done for me, that you are a great God, a mighty God, a God who created me, a God who redeemed me, a God who says that I am your possession, I want to be your disciple. You need to have that vertical uh, relation with Lord Jesus Christ. And when that is established, let me assure you that you will have a similar horizontal relationship with one another. I cannot have a loving relationship with God and begin to hate my brother. It does not go together, my friends. If I love my God, God says in John chapter 13, verse 35, what does he say? By this shall all men know that you are my disciple. When? When you love one another. And so my relationship with God must be shown in my actions with one another. That is what I would call committed discipleship. That's my third point. Number one, curious discipleship. Good to begin with, but do not stop right there, my friends, because that is going to be fatal. Heaven cannot be your goal. You cannot be merely a convinced disciple. It will not, make, it will not help you to make it to heaven. You've got to be a committed disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24. And Jesus said unto the disciples, the text says, If any man come after me, let him deny his cross, I mean, deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. A committed discipleship calls for devotion, calls for sacrifice, willing to give up your darling sins, willing to give up something that is dear and near to your heart, willing to give up your possession, your position, your education, anything that is so dear to you, and say, Lord, I give up everything, and I seek you first. As we read in John, Matthew chapter 6, 33, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That is what I call true discipleship, committed discipleship. When you say, Lord, I'm fully committed to you. No, yes, I began as somebody very curious about you. Yes, I got, got, got convinced that you are my savior, but now I'm going to go a step further. I'm going to commit my life to you because I want to take up the call that you've given to me to be fishers of men. The God who looks down upon you this afternoon says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, you are a so chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. As we read in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 9, it says, I've called you by your name. In Isaiah chapter 44, verse 2, it says, I've formed you from your womb. And I have chosen you. In Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1, he says, I have called you from the womb. Not only did I form you from the womb, he goes a step further, he says, I have called you from the womb and I have identified your name. The most popular text that we have in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, what does he say? For all things work together for good to them that love God who are called what? According to his purposes. God does the calling by God's grace among the billions of people that live upon this planet earth. God has called you by name, my friends. I want you to be assured before you walk out of the sanctuary that he has called you to be the fishers of man, to reach the unreached with the everlasting gospel. 
It is not something that you should take it lightly because God in his mercy has called you. In fact, in John chapter 15, verse 16, he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and have ordained you. And so my appeal to you this afternoon is be a committed disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ so that you can be fishers of men of saving souls for the kingdom of God. The year was 1862. This country was in the midst of the Civil War. Here was Sam Davis as an young man, as a student studying in Nashville, Tennessee. But when he saw the war picking up steam, he decided to join the Confederate Army and fight against the Union Army. He proved to be a fearless soldier. But he didn't stop there. He also became, a, he excelled in being an undercover agent for the Confederate Army. But in November of 1863, he was captured and was thrown into the prison. After he had spent some time in the dark cell of the prison, one day the captors walked into his cell and said, Sam, we have a news for you. Our general says that if you can only identify the mysterious coal man, you will be set free. Today, you will walk through this door as a free man. And the story goes on to say, Sam, Sam Davis thought for a minute, looked into the eyes of the captors and said, Sir, I'd rather go through a thousand deaths than to betray my friend. That is the kind of commitment that you and I need to have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Willing to go through any kind of pain and suffering, even death. Because my friends, 50, 60, 70 years in the light of eternity is a drop in the ocean. And that is why I appeal to you, along with what the VBS children learned throughout the week, that we must be fishers of men, be true disciples, committed disciples for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the last night before he was going to be hanged, Sammy Davis sat there and he requested the chaplain to come over and he turned to the chaplain and said, Sir, can you sing for me? And Jordan Stormy Banks I stand. And as the song was being sung, as it, and they came to the chorus, Sammy Davis got up from his seat, began to sing aloud, I'm bound for the promised land. I'm bound from the promised land. Because his focus, his attention was not on what is going to happen to him tomorrow. Yes, they're going to put a rope around me. They're going to hang me. I don't care. Why? Because I'm bound for the promised land. Regardless of what might happen in our lives, in our earthly journey, my appeal to you that you will focus that heaven is your goal. Eternity is your goal. To walk on streets of gold to eat from the tree of life, to drink from the river of life, and to sit at the feet of Jesus eternally, looking at his beautiful face and say, Lord, thank you for what you did for me on the cross of Calvary. That is your ultimate goal. And for that to happen, we must be committed disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jordan Stormy Banks, I stand and cast a wistful eye on Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. I'm bound for the promised land. I'm bound for the promised land. Who will come and go with me because I'm bound for the promised land?